Hello and welcome back to Wholehearted. This is a special edition because we have an awesome guest with us today. And I don't want to take a whole lot of time uh, wasting on things. So I'll just introduce him right away. Again, Wholehearted, this is the Relationship Education Podcast where we give you the tools you need to build healthy and God-honoring relationships. Today, we have with us the CEO of the very popular satire website, The Babylon Bee, and all of their associated channels and pages. Uh, Today, Seth is going to be talking with us on the topic of connecting through humor, using laughs to build bridges in a seriously dividing world. So, Seth, thank you and welcome to Wholehearted. How are you today? I am good. Thanks for having me on. Cool. Great. Well, like I said, we're going to jump right into things here uh, because I do want to honor your time. I appreciate you being with us. Now, we got connected because you're actually going to be coming to town here in Omaha. Uh, You're going to be the keynote speaker at the Assure Women Center Banquet on May 9th. Now, I followed the B for a long time, like back in the day when it was like just the the articles that would come out and stuff. And I've always loved just the humor and being able to kind of poke at different sides and and draw the the funny things out of whatever situations were going on. And Assure is a, a institution, a company about uh helping save babies it's it's involved with the pro-life movement and that seems like an interesting connection so i'm curious seth uh what drew you into this area well um there's more backstory probably don't need to get all the backstory but in my uh in my own personal um education as i was reading more widely in things like theology and philosophy and christian apologetics and stuff like that i i did get into um the pro life apologetics stuff and and reading about um the case for life basically and what that entails and how to respond to these arguments from the pro abortion side they call themselves pro pro choice i call them pro abortion hmm. um and so i i had educated myself on those arguments um just out of personal interest in understanding what the arguments were what are the main uh points that each side is making and how can i defend life articulately and intelligently in in the public square um and i ended up on joe rogan's show uh it, it I saw was, that one, yeah yeah so this is it's going on two years ago. I think in August it'll be two years. So it's been a little while. Um, but I was on his show, and um, and one of my one of my good buddies who watches his show all the time um, told me, you know, the one thing you don't want to get into is a debate about abortion because you guys will butt heads on that. It'll get really contentious. Mm. And uh, I guess I didn't take that advice. I honestly, I I really would have to go back and watch it and see who brought it up first. I'm not sure who did. But we ended up debating abortion on on Joe Rogan's show, and um, I defended the pro life position, and he had he defended not necessarily just a general pro choice position, but like pro choice at least in certain circumstances, right? These extreme cases, and so uh, he went straight to the extreme case of like a teen rape victim, and and mm-hmm. and we ended up having a back and forth about that, which was it got a little heated because he was taking it very personally where he's pointing to the fact that he's got a teenage daughter and he brought his teenage daughter into it. He's like, what if my daughter, you know? Mm. And so, um, I defended the pro-life position on that podcast. I stayed very calm and, you know, I I reasoned with him about it. And I, I, I gave arguments for why I felt like it would be totally arbitrary to draw lines after the point of conception at when you start valuing human life. And, uh, and by the end of that conversation, you know, he kind of came around and said, you know, I see, I see what you're saying. I see where you're coming from, but uh, I made a couple of points. At one point, I, I to try to deal with the euphemisms that are used to cover up the the grossness and awfulness of abortion. You know, like calling it healthcare, for example. He had brought up rape, and I said, "Well, if you want to bring rape into it, I think abortion is healthcare the way rape is lovemaking." Ooh. And so, you yeah. know, I made some comments like that to try to push back on the euphemisms. And the the clips went uh, of that particular dialogue about abortion ended up going viral. 
Uh, and so there was a lot of conversation about that and the media from both sides covered it, you know, with yeah. the left, the media on the left, basically talking about how, you know, Rogan had, had shamed me and put me in my place and the media on the right talking about how I left Joe Rogan speechless. And so, you know, they both saw it from their own perspectives, but that kind of like, it was such a, a, a widely uh, observed conversation that it opened up a door to a lot of opportunities to speak out on that issue more. So long story short, I guess that's, uh, that's how I ended up doing a pro-life speaking tour. Yeah. Yeah. That is really interesting. I didn't notice that the, uh, Joe Rogan podcast was kind of the impetus for all of this, because like I said, I saw that, uh, probably pretty close to when it came out, I guess a couple years ago now, and uh, yeah, seeing you since then speak out more on these issues. I know you had at least one and maybe two interviews with like Lila Rose yep. and uh, yeah, speaking on these issues. So I think that's a very interesting kind of inroad and connecting point. And especially in that interaction that you had with Joe, uh, I think that was a really good example of two very different sides, very different opinions and beliefs and values, but having a calm and mature conversation, an emotional conversation. Like you said, he brought up his his teenage daughter and and, and it is a very contentious topic in our culture. And then being able to utilize just winsomeness and just listening skills and yeah. uh, even a little bit of humor at times to be able to kind of bridge those gaps. I thought that was a really excellent uh, use of that. And especially well, you because- got to use all the tools in your toolkit. You know, yeah. there's there's times where you need to um, refute bad arguments uh, and there's times mm-hmm. when you need to ridicule bad ideas. And so rid- ridicule and refutation are two different tactics um, sometimes for two totally different contexts. Um, but you know, there's no reason why you ever have to just deal in one. And I think you mm-hmm. should be willing to use one or the other, depending on when the situation calls for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's perfect. That's exactly where I was going to go. Like being able to use humor in these heavy conversations and, and just use relatability, uh, you talked about that being a tool that you can use. Uh, a lot of times we see it being as like a, a cudgel that you're beating the other person with, or you're just mocking the other person. Uh, but the way that you used it in that interview and the way that it can be used is to actually help people see different perspectives. So how do you use just in a conversation like that, uh, where you're not necessarily like making a skit or doing a, a satire article or something. How do you use it in just day-to-day life to be able to connect with people the day the way you did with Joe? Well, I think Joe that that I think that debate was primarily an example of <clears throat> of refutation, not mockery mm-hmm. or ridicule. You know, I wasn't I wasn't trying to mock and deride his position. I think uh the example that I gave of abortion being uh healthcare the way that rape is lovemaking was kind of like a uh it was a jarring um comparison that was you know provocative but it's provocative because it's just trying to tell the truth it's it's stripping away the dressing of the euphemism that you're covering up abortion with and so um i wasn't really i wasn't in that in that conversation at that time in that moment you know, resorting to jokes, uh, yeah, and, yeah, and trying to and, and laughing at his position or anything like that. Um, we do all, we do make jokes on topics like that w- at the Babylon Bee, and it's a, it's very tricky to do, honestly. You know, when you're when you're dealing with kind of these tougher, serious, um, weighty issues that where which isn't really fun. Like abortion isn't funny. I don't think anybody thinks abortion is funny. Um, So not all satire, though, is meant to be laugh out loud funny. In some cases, you know, satire is is using um, a form of, you know, mockery or exaggeration or ridicule to make a very serious point. It can be a a very serious business um, uh, at at times. And so it'll make you wince as often as it will make you laugh when you're dealing with a more serious issue like that. Um, and so the, the, the goal is not always just to make people laugh out loud or to make them feel bad. Like you were saying, you know, using it as a cudgel or uh, a blunt instrument to, you know, hurt somebody. Obviously, mockery can be used that way. 
and and people will often employ it that way as like an ad hominem attack or to make somebody feel bad about themselves. And I don't, I, I don't really agree with that use of it. And I, I don't think that's helpful. I think, I think that the, um, the best use of mockery is to expose foolishness in the, in the way that we're doing it anyway, and, and with, with satire is to expose foolishness for what it is so that it isn't taken seriously. And, you know, when you have, when you have really bad ideas, bad ideas have catastrophic consequences. So I mentioned, you know, uh, reputation and ridicule. It was C.S. Lewis who said that good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Mm, and and yeah. that's that's his explanation for why we need good, uh, sound arguments for what we believe and why we believe it. If for no other reason, because there's going to be all kinds of bad ideas out there that need to be confronted or else they will have damaging effects. Um, and so there's you, you can refute them and and argue with the person and present your arguments and you can use good philosophy as, as Lewis put it, or um, you can also ridicule the bad ideas and tear them down so that they're not taken seriously. And we're talking specifically about the ideas, not the people behind them advancing mm -hmm. them, right? So you're ridiculing bad ideas. So they aren't taken seriously. And I, I do think there's a moral imperative to do that. Um, largely because what's happened is if you, if you actually look around and you look at our culture, you know, we're taking these ideas like crazy ideas, like boys, uh, can be trapped in girls' bodies or mm -hmm. vice versa. And and the way to treat that problem is to, you know, sterilize and mutilate their bodies and try to align their um their body with their broken minds. So you're breaking the body to match the broken mind. Yeah. And and that is such a damaging and destructive idea that only breeds despair in the end. And so I think it's the kind of idea that you promote if you hate children and want them mm -hmm. to suffer. And so it is it is deserving of mockery. That idea is deserving of mockery and it's a good thing when you attack it. Yeah. And actually that's that's really interesting because this month we are talking all about coping. And in the video that we'll be shooting later today, I actually present that as one example of how um, in our culture, we, in the idea of trying to protect and trying to, uh, you know, mental health and in that whole conversation, uh, we end up blocking people from the very things that they need. And rather than being able to allow truth to come to uh, light and help these people, live their lives in a way that it is congruent with reality. We all are now being told to accept this false sense of reality and affirm this false sense of reality, which doesn't help the individual. It doesn't help society. And these are just, a, just real quick, not to yep. derail you, but there was a, there's a great quote from a psychiatrist. Yep. I'm trying to remember what his name was. Uh, I, it's escaping me. Uh, but he said, mental health is, is um an ongoing commitment to reality at all costs or something mm. like that. I'm kind of paraphrasing. I'm not getting it perfectly right, but he's like mental health just is a dedication to reality at all costs. And if and at any point where you're straying from reality and either your perception of yourself or the motives of others or what your identity is or any of those things, the moment you stray away from what reality is is the moment you're heading off into a state of delusion and leaving the realm of mental health where you're no longer mentally healthy. Yeah. Um, I think that's a profoundly important way of, of looking at it. It's, it's the, it's the correct way of looking at it because like you were saying, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the coping mechanisms that we're putting into place or the, or the safe spaces that we're tucking people in a way in to try to insulate them from ideas that might confront them with truth. For example, you're protecting them from reality itself in the interest of securing their mental health. When in, when in truth, Mental health is a dedication to reality. Mm, that's powerful. Yeah, I mean, that's you made my point for me. So that was that was a perfect <laughs> interjection there. Now, as I like what you had said earlier, as you are having these conversations, you're not attacking the person; you're attacking the idea. It's the idea of the, like kind of the emperor has no clothes. And rather than exposing the individual and attacking the vigil, you are exposing this false ideology. And it's kind of like when you have your target set in the right place, you can you can kind of let loose and expose 
the ideology for what it is because it's actually the ideology that keeps people trapped, keeps people in bondage. And so you can let loose on the ideology, but then carrying that balance of like, I'm not attacking the person. Yeah. I'm actually doing this out of a place of love and a commitment to the betterment of the individual, regardless of how they are, you know, perceiving it in the moment. If yes, because they will, the perception is important because they will perceive it as an attack on their person, yeah. you know, especially if you, for example, if you refuse to affirm somebody in their gender identity by using the pronouns that they are requiring you to use, they will perceive that as an attack on who they are, your denial of who they are. Um, and so, but, but, but you're not trying to attack them and make them feel bad about themselves. If anything, I think, I think the loving thing to do is to, is to confront people with the truth rather than affirming a lie. Um, you're certainly not helping them by by doing that. And so it can be perceived as an attack, even if it isn't intended as an attack. Mm. So how do you how do you go about that? I mean, it's one thing to have this conversation online or have a public debate. But when you're in a room across the table from somebody that you genuinely care about and you want to help them to see that this thing is actually hurting them, this ideology, this belief about their own identity or whatever, or that, you know, we're talking about abortion, like this hurts the mother, this hurts, like this murders the child. Like mm. these are heavy, heavy concepts that again, we can be very emotionally driven to just want to like win that battle. How do you personally balance the the truth and love aspect of it well one thing to be mindful of is that you're you you don't want to come across as if as if you're trying to win a debate and put them in their place and shut them down you just want to help them see from another perspective and mm -hmm. explain why without without again making it uh, doing everything that you can to show that you're not attacking them personally or or even judging them you're just simply explaining your rationale for why you believe what you believe and and stick you know keep them keep the main thing the main thing because you can get you can get um taken off course by all sorts of red herrings and and objections that really have nothing to do with the main point and if you end up chasing those you'll end up going around in circles with each other and you really just need to address whatever the main point is of contention and what the pros and cons are for that and keep it focused on that um so, I mean, in a in a face to face conversation, I do think it's a lot easier uh, to have empathy and and to not get overly heated about it or to be putting somebody down or making them feel bad. Because when you're when you're behind your keyboard and your monitor uh, and you have that distance between you and that other person, people get really nasty and or can become very confrontational and and ultra defensive. And when you're in person, face to face with somebody, you know, you just talk to them like another person. You see them. They're right in front of you. You can see how they feel and how they're reacting to what you're saying. And you can and you can be mindful of that and how you're communicating what you're communicating. Um, but it's just sticking sticking to the points and making your case and using um, uh, uh, reason and logic and evidence to support what you're saying. It's you, you've got to you've got to deal with those things. The Like in the, in the debate that I had with Joe Rogan, I laid it out as a syllogism. I said it's wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human. Mm -hmm. uh, abortion intentionally kills an innocent human therefore abortion is wrong and if he if he wants to tell me that it's not wrong then he's got to uh then he's got to knock down one of those two premises in the argument and so which one is he going to deny is he going to deny that it's wrong to to intentionally kill innocent humans or is he going to deny that abortion does that yeah pick one and let's have a conversation about that and and take all the emotion and stuff out of it. If you the more you can uh, remove the emotion from it, the more you can actually get down to the actual arguments themselves. Mm, yeah. I actually heard that exact syllogism. I think it was uh, Matt Walsh the other day used that exact approach and was talking about like how in politics we don't see that type of logical thinking through the issue when it comes to abortion, even from the conservative well, side. I mean, yeah. I mean, think about all the objections. People will say, you don't have a uterus. You can't have an opinion on this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, which premise in that argument is falsified by the fact that I don't have a uterus? Yeah. Which one? 
It doesn't matter what my how my body is is composed, what biological characteristics I have. What matters is whether or not each premise in the argument is true. And mm. so you have to actually deal with the argument itself. Or they'll say, oh, well, you're only pro-life. Uh, you're only pro-birth. You're not pro-life because you don't care about kids after they're born. Again, it's irrelevant. It's what if what is my let's say I'm the biggest hypocrite in the world who uh, everything in my life is a double standard. Okay, well, what does that have to do with the truth of the premises in the argument? Mm. It doesn't how I behave, whether I'm a good person or a bad person or a hypocrite or not, is completely irrelevant. That's an ad hominem attack on the person giving the argument rather than a response to the argument itself. So you have to just keep bringing it back to which premise is false and why. And you know, don't give me some ridiculous red herring or distraction or irrelevant detail about myself because that doesn't help your case. Yeah. That takes a lot of discipline yeah. <laughs> to be able to recognize those red herrings when they're thrown out there and to not chase after them. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, a lot of them have a lot of discipline. emotional force, but that's what they're designed to do. They're designed yeah. to to make you feel bad about a certain scenario. You know, um, yeah, but what if these kids grow up in poverty and they're suffering or whatever? Okay, so it's better to be dead than poor. <laughs> Um, you know, there will be a lot of emotional force behind them, and that, but that that is the that is the point, though, is to distract from the 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 logic and the evidence with emotion, mm -hmm. um, and that can be that can be very powerful. It's it's effective rhetorically, um, but it doesn't refute the argument. Yeah, and and I think that's one of the reasons that it's so difficult in our modern culture in our context today is that we are very postmodern. And so it seems like what you're driving towards is truth, is objective reality. But mm -hmm. when we live in a postmodern civilization that rejects objective truth and objective standards, uh, it can be very hard to try to just pin somebody's feet down and say, but what do you say about this? Like all the other things whatever but this is an objective truth standard and i feel like that's one of the harder places to not become emotional to not become angry and to start just you know name calling like what is wrong with you you're an idiot like that kind of <laughs> stuff because well that's you, where humor that's yeah. where humor can be diffusing because you know i do i do believe that humor is unifying i think that humor Humor, um, as Chesterton put it, humor can get in under the door while seriousness is still fumbling at the handle. And so whatever point you're trying to make seriously could be made much more effectively potentially with a with a disarming joke. Mm. You know, it's a it's a vehicle for truth delivery that's a lot less offensive than than beating somebody over the head with a with an argument and trying to shove the evidence in their face. Yeah. Um, and I, we see this all the time, like to go back to the the trans stuff for, as an example. We, we had done a joke about how a motorcyclist identified as a bicyclist and set a world record. And and it went crazy viral. You know, millions of people were sharing that all over the place. And uh, and we and we ended up getting a lot of emails from people who were saying, I'd never thought about it like that before. You know, you kind of like open my eyes to the absurdity of, of biological males, you know, competing in women's sports. Um, sometimes humor can be effective in, in getting people to, to see things. And it's less offensive because the aim of it is you know is to be disarming and to make people laugh rather than to upset them um yeah. so you got to have the right attitude though you know I, I do think that a, a big part of the problem in our current culture is that people take themselves so seriously that they aren't even willing to allow humor to do its work it's healing work mm -hmm. you know humor the humor is treated as harmful instead of something that's that's has healing power and uh and that is a massive mistake because the minute you start to shut down humor and jokes, you know, when we're willing to poke fun at ourselves and laugh at ourselves and and even be willing to laugh at at each other and each other's inadequacies uh, and mistakes and double standards and, and idiocy. You know, we're all passengers on the ship of fools from time to time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, when we're not willing to do that anymore. And we're and we're taking ourselves so seriously and everyone else so seriously and protecting other people, not even ourselves, but other people from being offended by a joke, trying to prevent them from being hurt as if they can't handle it. 
uh, you're not helping anybody in that case because the, the the jokes themselves, which allow us to laugh at ourselves, is a it's a mature thing. It's a it's a it's a form of self reflection and acknowledging that we're all imperfect and we're all imperfect together. And and there the the healing power of that is is so profound because you can have a, a room full of people of different races and genders and ages and nationalities and religions all coming together to laugh at each other and themselves. It's so much healthier than having those same people at war with each other, um, you know, trying to play who's the bigger victim um, mm -hmm. in the, in the, you know, the oppression hierarchy. It's yeah. just, it's absolute nonsense. So that, that has started to infect comedy and, you know, comedians are, are worried about getting in trouble for punching down on people who are beneath them and have less power and privilege than them. Um, and everyone's protected in their little safe spaces and they don't want to be offended. And I think that, you know, taking away humor's uh, ability to heal by treating it as harmful is in fact harmful. Definitely, man. I, I really appreciate this conversation. I, I thank you, you know, for your time and just your insight, being willing to talk about something that is like we've said, just a very contentious, very hotly debated topic that yep. if you stick your neck out here, you know, it's likely to get chopped off in our culture. <laughs> uh, so just as we wrap up, um, I do, again, you're coming here to town uh, next month for the Assure Banquet. So I, I'm looking forward to, hopefully I'll be able to meet you in person. I'll be there. Be uh, but before we go, uh, do you have any other events or anything that you would like to share? Let our audience know where they can find you, any of that kind of stuff. A uh, ton of events on my calendar, but that's the big <laughs> one we want to promote today. Um, I can be found on X, formerly known as Twitter. So can the Babylon B. Um, that's our that's our biggest social platform right now, and our safest one because wow, yeah, we have some assurances from Elon that comedy is going to remain legal there, which is which is kind of nice. It wasn't for some time. Yeah, um, yeah. You can find us on social media. We do have an app, our website, BabylonB.com. Um, check us out, follow us there, get on our email newsletter so you can get our our joke sent to you every day. Um, yeah, I, I, that would be all I would say. Um, we don't have we we do have a book that's coming soon. It's like pre order right now. Uh, the Babylon Bee Guide to the Apocalypse. Um, try to pick that up before the world ends. Yeah, <laughs> if you can get it out before the world ends. Exactly. That's that's the race against time right now to try to yeah. get that book out before it's too late. Awesome. Well, once again, thank you so much for being with us. I I appreciate you just spending this time with us and having this awesome conversation. Uh, if you are watching, make sure you're following Babylon B, you're following Seth on their different pages. Be on the lookout for that book. And uh, thank you guys for joining us here on Wholehearted, where we give you the tools you need to build healthy and God-honoring relationships. So thank you guys. Have an awesome day. We'll see you next time.